All right, let's talk about something lighter. <laughs> like the woman, the dragon, and the beasts. <laughs> Revelation 12 and 13. Actually, I love these chapters, and I hope that you will too if you don't already. Today we're going to get into a couple of the most fascinating chapters in the book of Revelation. And again, there's some challenge in interpreting these rightly, but I think, again, they're easier than some of the other material we've already been through. And the picture they give us of present spiritual realities and battles is very enlightening. Now, here's what I want to do today. Um, I want to briefly recap the message of Revelation up to where we left off last time, and then I want to take just a bit of time to look in greater detail at the seventh trumpet, because I didn't have enough time to consider some of those amazing truths back in chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. And after that, we'll take a look at the four main sections of our passage for today, including the woman, the dragon, Satan being kicked out of heaven, the beast, and the often discussed topic, the mark of the beast. Actually, we probably won't get to that till next time. <laughs> so we got a great deal to cover. Let's get started with the brief review of Revelation 4 to 11. I'm going to start again at chapters 4 and 5 because these are such pivotal chapters in the book of Revelation. You'll remember that in chapter 4, John gets a glimpse into heaven where he sees God seated on the throne, magnificent scene reminiscent of the throne room scenes of Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1. And here the 24 elders surround the throne of God, and though we're not sure of their precise identity, their significance in this passage is to lay their crowns at the feet of the one who is the central majesty in all the universe. Inside the circle of the 24 elders are four living creatures representing all of creation, wild animals, domestic creatures, humans, and birds of the air, and they surround the throne and never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, I mention that language specifically today because it's what we're about to see in one of our passages. Revelation 4 portrays the sovereignty of God in heaven with all the angels and creatures giving him praise and the glory he deserves. And then chapter 5 presents us with the problem of who will be worthy to open the scroll, the contents of which will explain how God's sovereignty in heaven will be established on earth where it's presently contested. The messianic lion of Judah, the root of David, is worthy to break the seals on the scroll, and he's worthy because he's already won the decisive victory over God's enemies, not by military might, but by sacrificial death, which effectively ransomed people from, for God from every nation and people on earth. And as the lamb opens the seven seals on the scroll, a set of seven warning judgments is sounded. This is the first of the three series of seven judgments. And the uh, purpose of these, sorry, each of those seven series of judgments, remember, ends with the actual return of Christ. And the purpose of these warning judgments is to lead men and women to repentance before the return of Christ. But as we see in both the series of seals and trumpets, the warnings themselves are not sufficient to turn the hearts of men to Christ. Between the sixth and the seventh seal, the army of 144,000 martyrs is sealed. And this passage takes the form of a military census in Israel. But as John is prone to do, he reinterprets the image he sees, he hears with the image that he sees. So when John turns to see the 144,000 from Israel sealed, what he actually sees are an innumerable multitude taken from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. Their role in the coming of God's kingdom is going to be further expanded upon in chapter 11 and then also in chapters 12 to 14. What we learn, that there, what we learn about this seal that they receive is that it's a seal of protection not from physical harm, but rather from spiritual harm. And it is their prayers that ascend before the throne of God, which ultimately bring about the final judgment as was symbolized in the casting down of the censer. The seventh seal leads to the judgments of the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets are a more severe set of warning judgments. And the more I reflect on them, the more I'm convinced they portray the devastating effects of idolatry on God's creation and on people. But the effect of these judgments is not the repentance intended, but rather a further hardening of heart. And this prepares us for the opening of the scroll in chapters 10 and 11. 
There we meet a mighty angel, who I made the case is the angel mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, who descends from heaven. He brings with him a little scroll, which is, I argued, the same scroll as the one we saw in chapter 5. And he opens the seals on that scroll, or Jesus opens the seals on that. And then here in chapter 10, he presents that open scroll to John. That completes the transmission of the message of Revelation, which the Father gave to Christ, who gave it to his angel, who here in chapter 10 gives it to John, who will then give it to God's servants, namely the first recipients and us. John takes the scroll from the hand of the angel in a scene reminiscent of Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3, and he eats the scroll. In his mouth, it tastes sweet because it's the word of God, but in his stomach, it becomes bitter because it is a message of continued suffering for the church and ultimate judgment upon God's enemies. The scroll that John eats and digests becomes the content of his prophecy in chapter 11. Here, John measures the temple and the altar and those who worship there. These stand symbolically again for the people of God in their wholeness and their witness. And John is told that the outer court of the temple will be trampled on for 42 months, which is the equivalent of Daniel's, Daniel chapter 12's, a time, times, and half a time. The point again is that God's people will suffer at the hands of the nations, but they will be protected from spiritual harm in the innermost place the length of time that they will suffer is 42 minutes sorry 42 months again equivalent to the time times and half a time which is a symbolic number depicting the time between christ's first and second coming the entirety of that time during this time the two witnesses that is the church will prophesy wearing sackcloth the church will witness to the nations for exactly as long as the church suffers at the hands of the nations the entire period of time, these latter days between Christ's first and second coming. The rest of the parable depicted in chapter 11 shows that the church will be protected in its witness as long as necessary for it to make its witness to God. And after that task is complete, the beast will uh, complete his war on them, apparently defeat them, and John's gonna go into more detail on that subject today. No particular city is in view here when John mentions Sodom, Egypt, and Jerusalem, but rather every city in which the church testifies faithfully to the one true God will become the setting for the suffering of God's people as surely as Egypt was and Sodom was and Jerusalem was. After a period of time referred to as three and a half days, the church will be raised to new life and God's judgment will be poured out on his enemies. The most important part of this vision is what we read in chapter 11, verse 13. The church's suffering witness and not judgments alone will be the key to bringing about the conversion of the nations and ushering in God's final kingdom upon earth. And that leads us to the seventh trumpet. So let's read Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19 to recall what we saw last time. And there we read, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So this passage proclaims the final victory, the end of time. And here we see a number of interesting things. First of all, we read in verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. There's an interesting theme that can be followed from the beginning of the Bible all the way through the end, and that theme is kingdom. 
In Genesis 1 and 2, prior to the fall, God's kingdom was firmly established on earth. The kingdom of this world was the kingdom of our Lord and God. But in Genesis 3, with the entrance of sin into the world, there was a divorce between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. The rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 to the end of Revelation is the story of how God will reestablish and consummate his kingdom throughout the earth without destroying his people in the process. The death of Jesus Christ is the answer to the question, how can God remain holy and yet spare his people from the wrath they deserve? In the cross, God effectively defeats the opposition, but the final consummation of his victory awaits the return of Christ. His intention is that between the cross and the second coming, many will turn to him in repentance and faith and be spared the coming wrath. Here in this verse, John takes us to the end of all that history has been moving toward, the reuniting of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. Now, this ought to have profound implications for how we live our lives today. God's reign is unquestioned in heaven at this very moment, and someday it will be unquestioned here on earth as well when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are the people who acknowledge by faith right now that God is not only king in heaven, but also the rightful king on earth as well. While there are many who would set themselves up as being the king of the earth, or at least their little portion of the earth, we must reject their claim to the throne and acknowledge the only one true king. Similarly, we must beware of our own tendency to want to usurp God's throne while he's away because we confess that he is coming again. And those who have acknowledged his rule right now by faith, those who have abided by the laws of his kingdom now, even when it may cost them their lives for doing so, they will be rewarded when the king returns. But those who've usurped his throne, those who have acknowledged the reign of the usurpers, those who have elevated their own laws and customs and worship above the heavenly kings, for them there will be hell to pay. As Christians, we are witnesses to the rightful king of this world. Our role, our call is to proclaim to the nations and to our neighbors that there really is a king over this world at this very moment, despite the way things appear. His reign is contested, but the resurrection of Christ is the proof that this king has won the battle for this earth. Today, he delays his return so that all will have the opportunity to accept his offer of pardon but if any continue to reject his offer and oppose his rule and coming kingdom, then when he does come, he will be coming for you. Our lives also are to be a testimony to the fact that we believe there is a different king over this earth than the ones others are serving. Our lives are to be a picture of what life as a member of his kingdom is like, characterized by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's what his kingdom is like. Thus, as citizens of that kingdom, that's what we should be like. The kingdom of this world, dominated by sin and groaning, will be brought into subjection to the king of kings. The implicit question is this. Which kingdom are you living for? To whom do you belong and for whom are you living? The second interesting thing we see in this passage is that this seventh trumpet refers, again, to the events of the last day. You remember the formula we saw twice in chapter one that referred to God as him who was, sorry, who is and who was and who is to come? Well, now here in chapter 11, verse 17, he is referred to as God Almighty who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Which, what's missing? Who is to come? The king who is to come is now the king who has come. The whole passage has allusions to Psalm uh, chapter 2, which we don't have time to look at now, but you might find interesting as you compare this section to that psalm. Finally, the third thing I want to point out to you is in verse 19, where it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So here John is not looking into any earthly temple, but rather into the heavenly temple of which the earthly temple was just a mere shadow. I talked last week about why I don't believe there's going to be a rebuilding of a temple and, and whatnot. It's just simply a shadow of the reality 
which is uh, in heaven, a spiritual reality. Well, in the Old Testament, the ark is the symbol of God's presence among his people. And to say it's a symbol is almost too light of a word. I mean, when people touched it, they died, right? It's, God was somehow present with that ark in a way that he wasn't in other places. But it was the symbol of God's presence with his people. But the ark could only be seen once a year on the Day of Atonement by the high priest, and he was the only one who could see it. But here on the heavenly Day of Atonement, no priest needs to enter the holy place because the curtain's been drawn aside and now all the congregation may see for themselves the symbol of God's presence with them. That's what's coming. What's pictured here is direct access to the presence of God fully restored to, to God's people. And that brings us to chapter 12 of Revelation, the woman and the dragon. Starting here in chapter 12 and then stretching through chapter 15, the role of Christ's followers in ushering in the kingdom of God is going to be expanded upon. Remember, the central command to Revelation's hearers, both in the original seven churches who received it all the way down through today, is to conquer, overcome, conquer. The promises of this book, and particularly the promise of entrance into the new Jerusalem, are reserved only for those who overcome. Except for a brief mention in Revelation 11, verse 7, we haven't actually been told what we're conquering until we get to chapter 12. And it's here in chapters 12 and 13 that we meet the principal enemies of God who must be defeated to make way for, the, for his kingdom to come on earth. Who are these enemies? Well, briefly, I'll tell you, they are the satanic trinity, we might say. Satan, the beast, and the second beast. They're presented as a counterfeit of the true trinity, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm going to argue as we go along that the dragon is Satan. The beast is the imperial power of Rome. And the second beast is is the propaganda machine of the imperial cult of Rome. Now, I don't believe those historical reference exhaust the imagery of the beasts, and there's much more to be said about these things, but I would want to start there. So let's read Revelation 12, verses 1 to 6, before we continue. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them on the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for, you will never guess it, 1260 days. It may be helpful to begin our look at this passage by identifying those three main characters. So first we see a pregnant woman, then we see a great red dragon, and finally we see a male child. The pregnant woman is the mother of the Messiah. But by that, John does not intend for us to understand Mary. The mother of the Messiah is the messianic community. Here, the pregnant woman stands for God's chosen people from whom the Messiah, and then through him the church, is born. The image of this woman goes back to the time before Israel, however, all the way back to Eve herself. That's where we first encounter a woman and a serpent. Now, you remember that the serpent deceived Eve, which led to the fall of humanity into sin. And God's response to the serpent was the great promise we read in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So in that verse, God's people are promised that an offspring will come from the woman who will crush the serpent. The serpent of Genesis 3 is the dragon of Revelation 12. The offspring of Genesis 3 is the male child of Revelation 12. The offspring does come through Eve and also through Israel, and it is primarily the people of God as a whole that's in view here. Now, in verse 2, we're told that she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, there's an interesting similarity between this passage and one that we read in John chapter 12, John chapter 16, verses 20 to 22, where Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for the pains that are going to come through his, the final piece of his ministry. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. It's very interesting. Here, the community of disciples living through the trying events of the suffering and the death and the glorification of the Messiah, Jesus, are compared to a woman giving birth. And we receive further confirmation of the, of the, uh, that this woman represents the people of God under both the Old and the New Covenants, when we're told in verse 1 that she wore a crown of 12 stars. For John, of course, 12 is the symbolic number of God's people. My conclusion then is that the woman represents, again, the community of God's people, which through a long and turbulent history prepares the way for the Messiah and through great pains and labors finally gives birth to him. And we'll see the meaning of that birth later when we get to verse 5. Now, the second character we encounter here is the great red dragon. And starting in verse 3, we read, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, the imagery of the red dragon likely comes from the book of Isaiah, Chapter 27, 1, where we read, In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. The imagery of the dragon is used throughout the Old Testament to represent evil kingdoms that persecute God's people. In Isaiah, the dragon, also known as the Leviathan, the fleeing and twisting serpent, is probably a symbol of the particular political power oppressing God's people in Isaiah's day. Leviathan is referred to five times in the Old Testament in different ways, but all of them showing that although Leviathan is powerful, he is subject to the creator God. Now here in Revelation chapter 12, the image of the dragon represents the devil himself, as we'll see in just a few moments when we get to verse 9. And the significance of his seven heads and ten horns, while it's not totally clear, seems to be that his seven heads and seven diadems represent his pretension to sovereignty over the earth. Though he is the God of this world, as 2 Corinthians 4.4 tells us, Revelation makes clear that he rules only over his own people. And his time of ruling is running out. And he knows it. And the fact that he has 10 horns indicates that he is very strong. The horn is a symbol of strength throughout the scripture. He's got 10 of them. That's very strong. But here I think is an important point for us to remember as well. Satan does indeed have a great deal of power, no doubt. But his power is only over those who belong to him. He's not your God. You do not owe him obedience or homage He rules over the present world order, but you have been transferred out of the present world order. 
from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Your king has defeated the dragon, and you share in that victory over him. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James says. So to sum up our second character, then, the dragon is Satan, and as we'll see, he's the driving force behind the two beasts we'll encounter later on. Verse 4 says that his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, Satan sweeping down a third of the stars of heaven, casting them to the earth, most likely refers to the result of a war going on in heaven. And as we've seen a number of times already, stars represent angels here in Revelation. Therefore, what John introduces here only briefly is the idea that Satan the dragon fell and brought a third of the angels with him. Probably ought not to hold strictly to, you know, a third exactly, but nevertheless, we're given an impression as to the scope of this heavenly war. A significant number of the angels fall with Satan in this defeat. John's going to expand on this war starting in verse 7, so we're going to pick that up again in a few moments. But the third character we meet is the child, the male child. And we read starting halfway through verse 4, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So all we're told of the male child is that he is born of the Messianic community, and we're told that he will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Does that sound familiar? Of course. Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where God says, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This we know is a messianic psalm. This is about Jesus. And so the child depicted as being born in Revelation 12 is the Messiah. It is Jesus himself. Now we saw earlier in verse 4 that the dragon intended to devour the child the moment he was born. And then in verse 5 that the child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now scholars disagree as to the precise meaning of the actual birth moment here. Some would argue that this is Christ's literal birth in Bethlehem and that the dragon's attempt to devour him refers to Herod's killing of all the male children under two years old and then the family's subsequent flight into Egypt where they were protected. Possible that that's in view or maybe that's a portion of what's in view. But the fact that the child appears to be snatched up to heaven immediately after birth suggests a different view of what the birth means here which would not be surprising in Revelation. So following the lead of a number of others, I want to suggest that the birth of the Messiah here refers not primarily to the nativity scene of Bethlehem, but rather refers to the death and resurrection of Christ. Satan attempted to devour Christ through his crucifixion and death. But it was precisely through his death and resurrection that Christ escaped Satan's snare and ultimately defeated him. So while Satan thought death would bring Christ permanently within his power, death and resurrection was the means by which Christ was carried forever beyond Satan's power. It's an amazing depiction for us once again of how what looks like defeat to Satan and to those under his power is actually victory for the people of God. Also, chapter 12, verse 5 says that the child was caught up to God, which is a Greek verb sometimes translated as rapture. Now, many in the church, our church as well, believe in what's called a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, where those who trust in Jesus will be caught up, raptured, to uh, heaven just prior to the great tribulation. But interestingly, the only one in the book of Revelation described as being raptured or caught up is Jesus. And that rapture does not occur until after he has suffered and died. He is the pattern both of our suffering and of our glorification, which is one more reason why I don't share the view that Christians are going to be raptured out of here before tribulation. Because I believe tribulation is already happening and that it's going to continue to happen all the way until the time when Jesus returns and his enemies are defeated. 
So let me take this even further and remind you that Paul taught that when Christ died, all of us who are in him died with him. And so in the same way that Christ's death and resurrection took him forever beyond the reach of Satan's power, so our death and resurrection in Christ has also taken us beyond the reach of the powers of darkness. It's true that Satan may be allowed to attack the outer man, even to kill the people of God, but as we've seen several times already, the inner man is forever secure, hidden with Christ in God, sealed by the Holy Spirit now and forever. John goes on to say in verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now, the wilderness symbolizes testing and trial in the Bible, but it also symbolizes divine comfort and protection. You'll remember in the Exodus story that God delivered his people from the dragon Pharaoh by taking them where? Into the wilderness. And while for 40 years they were severely tested, they were also intimately cared for by God the entire time. So also the people of God are protected in the wilderness, though again, the protection does not imply that there will not be suffering. Rather, that Satan will not ultimately be able to harm any of God's own. And how long will the church be in the wilderness in which we are both tested and tried, but also intimately cared for by our God? 1260 days, the number we've already seen several times. And this period of time is, again, symbolic of the entire period between Christ's first and second coming. The latter days, 42 months, a time, times, and half a time, 1260 days. We saw in chapter 11, this is the amount of time that the church will be trampled upon by the nations. It's also the period of time in which the church will carry out our calling to be a witness to the one true God among the nations who have been deceived and are worshiping idols. It's absolutely amazing all the strands that John is tying together here. At least I'm amazed. So to briefly sum up the significance of these first six verses, we learn here that Satan is the dragon, the fulfillment of the Old Testament image of the serpent and Leviathan. He claims authority and power, and indeed, he does have power, but it's not as extensive as he would have you believe. His power is only power over his own, the people of this world. The woman reminds us of the first woman, Eve, to whom the promise was given that her offspring would crush the head of the serpent. It was not Eve's direct offspring, Seth, but the people of God down through the ages through whom God produced the promised offspring, the one offspring, the Messiah, Jesus. Satan did his darndest to devour the Messiah, but his efforts to destroy Christ only resulted in Christ's once and for all victory. And now God's people, composed of Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus, are living in the wilderness, not exempt from suffering, but protected by God until the Messiah returns, spoken of figuratively as these 1,290 days, 60 days, sorry, and that brings us to the great war and its effects. Let's read, starting in verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. 
The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. It's amazing. By the way, uh, just to remind you again, if you've got questions anywhere along the way, you're welcome to text them. Um, I haven't released a question and answer video for quite some time now, but I did record one. It just didn't turn out very well. So uh, I hope to have one coming out soon. And then, of course, any other questions that are coming in, I plan to answer them as have opportunity. All right, so this is a magnificent passage. Before we get into it, right up front, I don't believe that Revelation 12 is depicting the fall of Satan at the dawn of time. In other words, this is not a description of Satan's rebellion in heaven before the creation of the world as it might be described in Milton's Paradise Lost. The timing of the events of this passage are difficult to assign because they're events occurring in heaven. But I'm going to argue that the defeat of Satan depicted here occurs through the work of the Messiah and it occurs roughly around the time of his death and his resurrection. So the passage begins in verses seven and eight by telling us of a war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. Now, Michael's only mentioned in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 10 and 12, where he is described as a chief prince, apparently, of a heavenly army. His role in scripture is a military one. And here we see him fulfilling that role. He's engaged in battle. More could be said about him, but he's not the primary focus of the passage. So we're told that the dragon and his angels were defeated. And then in verse 9, we read, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Here, John ties together all kinds of images connecting the dragon with the serpent who deceives Eve in Genesis chapter 3. He's called the devil and Satan, two words describing his adversarial role, adversary, and Satan, his accusatorial role. That's what those words mean, adversary, accuser. Against God and his people. Finally, he's called the deceiver of the whole world. So as we consider the devil's work as it's portrayed throughout the Bible, clearly his primary method to disrupt God's plans are deceit. He begins by deceiving Eve in the garden, and he continues to attempt to deceive the people of God. When Jesus rebukes Peter for trying to keep him from going to the cross, Jesus recognizes that ultimately behind Peter's objection is the opposition of Satan. And so he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. In this verse, we see that Michael and his angels defeat Satan and his angels. Then starting in verse 10, we get the interpretive key for this whole section. Verses 10 to 12, we read, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony." For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. As he's done a couple of times already, John describes for us elements from a common story in the Jewish tradition about an encounter between Satan and God's angels. But as he so often does, he takes the traditional story or idea and he recasts it in light of the gospel. So what we see then in this Christian interpretation of this battle is that the really significant story is not that of Michael and Satan in heaven, but the earthly story of Jesus Christ and his followers. And the victory won here in this passage is none other, is none other than the victory of the Lamb, which was already depicted back in chapter 5. And as in chapter 5, the victory described here is won through Christ's death and his resurrection. This is made plain in verse 10, where the voice says, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. 
Satan, the accuser of the brethren, has been defeated at the cross. Now think about Paul's words in Colossians chapter 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. These are demonic powers. And put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So the accuser has been defeated because his list of accusations has been nailed to the cross. It's already happened. At the same time, John takes the image further to help us see that the church and its faithful witness still has a significant part to play in the defeat of Satan and his angels. The voice continues in verse 11. And they... The ones who follow the Lamb have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Now, as I mentioned, we were back in chapter 7, verse 14. The conquering by the blood of the Lamb referred to here is not purely a reference to Christ's death, but to the deaths of Christian martyrs. And even to those who simply have washed their blood and their, 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 their garments in the blood of the Lamb, who have been ready to follow him all the way to death. We know this because of how John describes the idea of conquering with a reference to the word of their testimony and the fact that they held fast to their testimony even unto death. At the same time, while their faithful martyrdom is their conquering of Satan, according to verse 11, their deaths don't have conquering value in and of themselves, but only in that they are a continuation of Christ's witness all the way unto death. Thus, it's by the Lamb's blood that they conquer. Their deaths conquer Satan only because their deaths are a participation in the victory of the Lamb that he has won over Satan by his death. What all of this leads us to then is that when the victory in heaven is being won, Christ is on the cross. The war going on in heaven between Michael and his angels is really the heavenly counterpart to an earthly reality. Christ's death and resurrection effectively boot Satan and his angels out of heaven, and the faithful participation of Christian martyrs in his death and resurrection is somehow also playing a part in this victory. The voice in heaven sings as though the martyrs have already died as faithful witnesses, but the reality is that from the perspective of this passage, their deaths are still in the future. They're still yet to come, not only for them, but for those of us living now. But the voice can sing of their martyrdom as already being accomplished fact because the victory of Christ was all-inclusive for his people. In him, the martyrs have already died, and with him, they've already conquered by being raised with him. And the task of the martyrs named here, and I would include us among those described, is to ratify and appropriate what Christ has already done once for all on our behalf. As I've said before, this book is about our victory in Jesus his victory first and foremost. Yet, through our union with him, we also participate in his victory. We shared in it on the day he died and rose again. And we share in it now as we faithfully live out the implications of our union with him in his death and resurrection. The result of this victory in heaven is described now in verse 12. The heavens are called to rejoice because Satan and his angels have been kicked out. But then we read this warning. Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. After the Messiah is exalted and Satan is defeated, he's banished from heaven, he's restricted in his action. This passage assures us that no matter how much evil might rage and no matter how much it might seem that Satan's in control, God's word assures us that Satan is a defeated power. He comes down in great wrath and with great fury not because he's invincible, but because he is desperate. In fact, it's one of the main themes of Revelation. The suffering of Christians is a sign not of Satan's victory, but of the saint's victory over Satan. He is desperate. It reminds me of the last two verses of that great Reformation hymn from Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress. He says, 
And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Does it not seem as though Martin was reading right through Revelation as he penned that magnificent hymn? He was actually reading through Psalm 46, but he certainly knew about this passage in Revelation as well. We can endure the rage of Satan because his time is limited and his doom is sure. Having said that, we continue in verse 13 where the story of the woman and the male child, which was introduced in verses 1 to 6, is now further explained for us. You see what's at, in Revelation, this is what happens. Some, oftentimes something is introduced, then we go to something else, and then we come back around and we see something else in another light or with further expansion. This is happening repeatedly throughout the book. We read in verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had, given, who had given birth to the male child. After his defeat, the devil now goes after the people of God, just as we see him doing all over the world even still down to this day. And then in verse 14, we read, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Again, I believe this verse is actually parallel to what we saw back in verse six. We've already read it. But the second time through gives us more information. Just as before, the flight of the Israelites away from Egypt and the dragon Pharaoh is recalled here through the mention of the wings of the great eagle. Why do I say that? Because of what we read in Exodus 19, verse 4. God speaking through Moses to his people. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. John connects the first exodus of the people of God out of Egypt with the new exodus of the people of God through the ministry of Christ. It's amazing. As we already saw in verse 6, God delivers the woman or his people into the wilderness where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. This again is a reference to God's care and protection for the period of tribulation stretching from Christ's first coming to his second coming, our time. In verses 15 and 16, the serpent is said to have tried to sweep the woman away with a flood. And then John interchanges the word dragon for the serpent. Clearly, these are both referring to Satan. Whatever the details are of this plot of Satan and what it meant that he's trying to wash them away with the water and so on, maybe again pointing us back to the Exodus, it's foiled by God. And it only makes Satan matter that he can't ultimately do harm to the people of God. We then read in verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So who does the rest of her offspring refer to if the woman already refers to the people of God? I think the best answer is that the woman represents the people of God from the heavenly perspective, we might say, and her offspring refer to God's people before the cross, and the rest of her offspring are his people on this side of the cross. And this is exactly where we come in as observers of the story. If you remember in Genesis 3.15, it went like this, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. The offspring of the woman is, first of all, Christ. But John says here that the offspring is also those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
The offspring of Satan is about to be revealed in chapter 13. But you are also his offspring. And perhaps what Paul is talking about in the book of Romans is precisely this, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet like a serpent. The offspring of Satan is about to be revealed in chapter 13, and thus what we will see in Revelation and in the world is the conflict played out between the offspring of Satan and the offspring of the woman, of which you are a part if you follow Jesus. Let's talk about the first beast. Actually, almost done. So we move on to chapter 13, and we encounter for the first time the dreaded beast of Revelation. You may remember in Revelation eleven seven 7, we were told that after the witnesses finished their testimony, the beast would rise up and conquer them. Here in chapter 13, we get a better understanding of who that beast is. So we get another picture of here's something is introduced. We come back around later. We get more information that fills out the picture. And now we get a better understanding not only of who the beast is, but of what the conquering of God's people entails. Chapter 12 ended with the dragon standing on the shore of the sand of the sea, and the implication is that he's the one who's going to summon forth the beast of chapter 13. So Revelation 13, starting in verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was also allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So here we're introduced to the first of two beasts. The beast, this beast is the beast from the sea, and in the next section we're going to meet the beast from the earth. Both beasts are clearly enemies of God's people, and while some of the details of the descriptions are not totally clear, their basic identities are clear, and their basic function, what they're trying to do, is clear, and would certainly have been clear to John's first audience. So in verse 1, the beast is described as having ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns it has ten crowns, and on its heads it has blasphemous names written. In verse 2, its features are described in language that comes straight out of Daniel chapter 7. Though we don't have time to look at that passage, you may find it enlightening to look at later on after this tonight. Suffice it to say that in Daniel 7, four beasts are portrayed as coming out of the sea. And these beasts represent various idolatrous kingdoms. Now, that's a major understatement about what's happening in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, but it'll have to suffice for now. What we see here in Revelation appears to be, if you were to go back and read those seven, the Daniel 7, what appears here is like a, the sum of the four beasts in Daniel. Perhaps the fourth of Daniel's beasts is portrayed as having swallowed up the first three or something like that. In Jewish writings, the fourth of Daniel's beasts was already identified with Rome. And so it's quite likely that John is alluding to that here. The fact that elements of the first three beasts are present in the fourth beast suggests the extreme fierceness of the, the, the beast. Now, given the beast's connection to the four beasts of Daniel, what John sees rising from the sea is the ultimate rebellious and arrogant 
empire, the living incarnation of everything opposed to God and his people. Because of this, the vision John has here is able to speak afresh to each new generation seeking evidence of the beast in their day, including our day. But for John's first readers, there's little doubt they would have understood the first beast to represent the Roman Empire and its imperial power, and the second beast to represent the imperial cult or emperor worship and everything that was connected with that. At the end of verse 2, we read the source of its authority. And to, the, to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So this beast is from the dragon. It has the power and authority of the dragon itself. In verses 3 and 4, we learn that the beast can do miraculous things. And consequently, the people of earth worship both the beast and the dragon who gave it its authority. In verse 5, we're told that the beast will be allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Again, the same number that indicates the span of time between Christ's first and second coming. So while the beast does represent Rome and its demonic demand for worship and utter allegiance, the fact is that its authority, the authority of the beast, spans the entire time of the church's conflict and suggests that this beast is every power that demands the worship that only God deserves. Looking at verses 7 and 8 in their entirety, it says, Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Here we're told again what we already saw again in 11 verse 7, that the beast will be allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. All those who do not belong to Christ will worship the beast. Perhaps it's worth a pause here to mention again a point that Revelation makes very clear. In the cosmic battle between God and his enemies, there is no neutrality. There's no Switzerland in the cosmic battle. You are either on his side or you are against him. This is not the case just in some future tribulationary period. John is describing the current state of things. The beast is already doing his work. He has been and he will continue until Christ's return. If you do not belong to the lamb, you are worshiping the beast, a cheap and wicked imitation of God. Furthermore, Christians are called to be distinct by not participating in the worship of this blasphemous beast. Many things, including governments, will demand your worship. Our materialist, our materialist culture demands that you participate in worshiping what money can buy, but you are called to worship the one true God and none of the false imitations. Now, what does it mean that the beast will be allowed to make war on the saints and conquer them? We've already seen that Christians are called to conquer, and they have conquered the dragon, and are now to conquer his offspring, the beast. But, but we're told that the beast conquers them. Is the point that the beast wins some battles and Christians win others? I don't think so. Rather, the same event is being described as both the beast's victory over the saints and the saints' victory over the beast. John is calling us to ask the question, who are the real victors? And the answer one gives depends on which perspective you're coming from. For those who see from an earthly perspective and who worship the beast, it appears as though the beast wins when he kills the saints. The beast can put Christians to death with apparent immunity, and it seems to confirm the apparent godlike might of the beast. It may be that even the Christians in the seven churches were tempted to see it that way, and even Christians suffering today. Is there any point in resisting the beast when he seems to have this irrefutable power? And the clear answer, of course, is yes. From the heavenly perspective, the one John calls us to see from, the martyrs are the real victors. To the faithful and to be faithful in witness to the true God, even to the point of death, is not to become a victim of the beast, but to take the field against him and win. It's a helpful reminder for us even today when we see or hear of Christian suffering or perhaps when we experience it ourselves, 
What looks like victory for the beast always in reality is victory for God and his people. So we have to ask, if God is allowing the beast to make war on the church and to conquer them, what should God's people do? John's answer is both frightening and wonderful in verse 10. If anyone wants to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone wants to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. If God allows the monster to make war and conquer his people, and if his people being conquered really means God's victory, then God's people must allow themselves to be conquered even as Jesus did so that we may also share in his victory. The church is called to submit to the unjust conquering attack of God's enemies. There is no call to take up the sword. There is no call to resist except to stand firm in your faith. There's also no promise that the church will not experience the tribulations of the present and future. Rather, there's simply a call to endure, to persevere. And the promise that what appears to man to be defeat is in reality a victory. May God give us grace to suffer unjustly at the hands of men for our testimony to Christ. And may our faithfulness in suffering proclaim even louder than our voices that the Lamb has triumphed and we triumph in Him. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have laid these things out for us in your word. And though they're not all likewise easy to understand, the overall message is plain. You have called us to overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, to be faithful even unto death to you, to proclaim that there is a rightful king, no matter how crazy this world is, that you are there and we will live for you regardless of the consequences. Help us to be faithful to that, to be your kingdom people, to be a people of light in this present darkness. And Lord, when it entails suffering, may we be faithful to continue. And for our brothers and sisters for whom it entails suffering today, we pray that you will help them to be faithful and to know that what may feel like defeat is the ultimate victory in Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. It's not even eight o'clock. Pretty good.